Hello, everyone. Welcome to Around the World with Dane Waters. I'm your host, Dane Waters. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here with each and every one of you. You know, it's uh, it's another one of those great uh, great days around the world. There's positives and negatives, as we always know. But sadly, you know, most of the time we have to talk about the That's negatives. Right. Uh, but we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what's going on. Now, listen, I have to do a recap, of course, two major things. What's going on in the United States with the presidential election, um, and then what's going uh, on in the Middle East, and both of those we will get to. But but what I want to talk about real quick is that, you know, around the world with Dane Waters, you know, it's always, we you know, most of the time we focus on, you know, the major spots around the world, whether it's uh, the United States, whether it's Russia and Ukraine, whether it's... Uh, the Middle East, but you know what, as, as we always talk about, every single time on this show, every single part of the world is integrated and intertwined with what's going on. Um, and today we'll be talking about uh, the Balkans, um, what's happening in the Balkans. Now, for those of you, I had to go to Google just to read this real quick. The Balkans includes Albania, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Bulgaria, Greece, Kosovo, Montenegro, North Macedonia, so I'll make sure we say North Macedonia these days, a little bit of Serbia and Croatia. So those are the countries we'll be talking about today with our with our guest, uh, General Konstantin Popov, who we'll introduce here in a second on the next uh, the next round. But but what's happening in these countries and in this region is just as important. It's just as important as what's happening in your backyard, as what's happening in Russia and Ukraine, what's happening in the Middle East, because every little piece of this planet matters. And the other thing I want to talk about real quick is before the break is that there are two ways to solve issues around the world. There is diplomacy, uh, and then there's through military might. Now, we hope, as the old saying goes, we uh, we uh, you know hope for the best, but plan for the worst. The reality is we always hope that diplomacy will work, but as we're sadly seeing around the world, diplomacy is not working like it should, which is why sadly there's more conflict. And on this show, I've had several generals uh, to talking about it, and that's because you know the generals like General Popov, who we'll see here in a minute and talk to in a minute. They're on the front lines. They literally are on the front lines helping us in the world uh, defeat evil and to uh, ensure that freedom and democracy prevail. So we'll get to that shortly. As you saw, uh, as it's scrolling through the screen, listen, we can dedicate the entire show <laughs> to the career of General Popoff. An amazing, amazing individual. <laughs> Excuse me, Sam, I'm all choked up now. See, I can't even talk. Yeah. Um, but no, General Konstantin Popoff, he's a gentleman that I've known, I've been honored to know and have in my life. Um, an amazing individual. Uh, he, you know, we have an organization called the Humanity for Freedom Foundation in the Balkans that he supports and helps when, uh, when possible. Uh, it's all about fighting authoritarianism and ensuring that the freedom and democracy uh, around the world prevails. But General Popoff is a uh, is a gentleman who has um, been on the front lines. He understands what it takes uh, to win, uh, and as we all know, the world is in turmoil. So we're going to spend the next 45 minutes, 30 minutes, talking about uh, with General Popoff about what's going on in the Balkans and how all that relates to the around world. So welcome, General Popoff. Thank you for being here today. Morning, Dane. Well, let's get started with the basics. So, can you give us an update about what's happening in the Balkans? Uh, is Russian influence 
uh, a problem in the Balkans? And, um, and just give us some thoughts on what do you think uh, we can do to counter that? Oh, so uh, you presented myself and my CV, and I saw that I'm quite fluent in English, but I should mention that I haven't practiced, so my English is a little bit rusty, so I hope you gonna understand me. But specifically speaking about the Balkans, uh, as you said, it's a complicated region. It looks like a puzzle uh, with a lot of uh, small pieces. It's difficult sometimes to put all of them together to get the big and sunny picture, hopefully. Uh, so a lot of influence during the centuries from the great powers in Europe, from Russia, and a lot of conflicts uh, and wars determined our history. So we're like a mixture of uh, different languages, religions, alphabet, culture, but we have to live at the same time on this beautiful place, uh, like we say Balkans, but Balkans, I believe it's a, a, a little bit like a political term, political term which e express the tensions, the love, the, everything what's happened here and uh, the importance of the Balkans uh, to the e Europe, because if the Balkans are destabilized, it affects Europe. So coming back to your question about Russian influence, uh, of course, historically, uh, Russia always tries to influence uh, uh, the region, the specific countries, to oppose one country to the other. And uh, we should be very naive if uh, we think that uh, Russia will miss this opportunity during the war, during their aggression against Ukraine to um, destruct the policy, to destabilize the region. And uh, what they do, how they do, probably we may go deeper in our talks later on. Listen, uh, well, first of all, I have to say that your English is far better than any other language I know, because I can only speak English and I don't do that quite well. So, uh, you know, I appreciate uh, I, I appreciate anyone in this world who can speak more than one language. So. Um, so, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I've been to the Balkans, traveled around, been there with you. Uh, you know what? I, you know, when we talk about destabilizing region, you know, one thing that we spoke on this show last week about was how Russia is getting more active in Africa in countries like Nigeria and how they're working to destabilize it. Like, what are they actually doing? Like when we talk about destabilizing a country, uh, what uh, are they really doing in Bulgaria and the Balkans to destabilize the region? Of course, they use a lot of different tools to do that. Uh, firstly, um, they use the social media to send their messages. Uh, the messages are, um, how to say, very well uh, prepared, sent uh, according to the uh, specific groups of people. Uh, they use their influence uh, to communicate with some parties, some leaders of uh, the specific parties in the region. Um, of course, another tool is to destabilize the economy and the war affected Balkans country, specifically their economy. Because as you know, uh, Russia was uh, the main supplier of gas, oil, a fuel for the nuclear power, power plant stations. Uh, so with the beginning of the war, uh, and they try to change the contract, the agreement with specific countries to be able to influence to the decision making process of the countries to stop the support of Ukraine. So or the traffic, uh, the trade uh, in the Black Sea was damaged badly. Uh, additionally, our countries should increase our defense budget. 
And at the same time, we have to uh, uh, take care uh, about a lot of migrants, immigrants that come from Ukraine, uh, in Romania, in Bulgaria. So it reflects finally to the income of the regular people because the regular people are suffering uh, and because they cannot achieve their standard of life that they are expecting to have. So using all the specific tools, uh, hybrid the disinformation, try to use their political links to the specific parts of our political environment. Um, there is a very comprehensive uh, Russian approach, Kremlin approach to destabilize the region. Well, and, and are they being successful? I mean, are the people in the Balkans and maybe specifically Bulgaria, are they starting to uh, be more anti-West and pro, you know, pro-Russia? I mean, what are they being successful is, is the critical question. Yeah, they're quite successful, by the way. Uh, I, I mean, they're quite good focusing the attention of some groups of people about what's happened on the battlefield who gains what, who attacks, who defends. So uh, the main attention, the, the main message in the social media, even to the official media on the TV, uh, some groups of Bulgarians are looking at this war as a soccer game, like uh, uh, Liverpool versus Manchester United. So the idea is to miss the main point uh, to uh, not to be focused on the human, humanitarian crisis. A lot of people were killed in uh, Ukraine. Uh, a lot of homes and towns and villages were destroyed. Uh, a lot of refugees, a millions, they left their own country looking for another opportunity. Uh, at the same time, um, uh, Many people, because of this very sophisticated disinformation that comes from Kremlin, uh, are missing the big picture. Uh, what will happen, for example, if Kremlin win this war? Uh, and I strongly believe that if Kremlin win this war, we're going to face another wars because this war will open the Pandora box and a lot of dictators and autocratic countries will see the opportunity to use the war uh, to achieve their economical, uh, political objectives to stabilize their regimes. And at the same time, we are facing uh, some regional wars, not to miss this opportunity to mention this one, but we see the war in the Middle East now, Israel defending the, uh, their country. Uh, so I would say that you may see a line of wars which starts from uh, Egypt and reach Belarus. And this line is broken only by three Balkan countries, Turkey, Bulgaria, and Romania. Can you imagine if these three countries are destabilized, those two major regional conflicts could be a one global challenge, let me say this way, politically correctly, uh, and we may face a very global problems in the future. So that is what we miss to explain to our public, to our people, to our friends, when we speak about Ukraine. And that's why Kremlin is so successful in doing uh, these hybrid things in the Balkan countries. That's extremely fascinating. No one actually has even talked about the fact that, that you'll create that, that line all the way from Egypt all the way up and uh, basically divide the world in half. You know, we talk often on this show about how we are the precipice of World War III.
Um, we are honored, as we talked about, having General Konstantin Popov from Bulgaria here with us. And uh, just before the break, we were talking about um, how the world is heading closer to World War III. Uh, and we, let's, let's, let's dig into that a little deeper because, you know, just as the news was, you know, they were showing the he headlines and the highlights of the news uh, on the screen before the, before the break, it's all negative. I mean, around the world, there's war, there's conflict. And as you mentioned, you know, we have the war in the Middle East, we have the Ukraine-Russian war, and the only separating uh, line between those is uh, Moldova and, Bul and, and Bulgaria. And, and so let's talk about it. What do you think, honestly, as a military man, what do you think the chances of a global war are? Oh. I don't believe that we're gonna face in the near future. I, I, I probably will disappoint some uh, uh, analysts here, but um, I truly believe as always been optimistic that the wisdom of the political leaders uh, are going to prevail. Uh, we should understand uh, what the evil is this war. And the evil to start the war is even worse. You should not take such a decision so easily like Mr. Putin did to kill the people, the humans to kill humans. So, hopefully, U.S. and Europe will get good leaders that are, boy, uh, are going to describe a better future for the world, to have the vision what the world should look like, to have a, this positive uh, uh, attitude, to be able to convince the people that they can live in a better world, and to be prepared to fight for it, to fight for democracy and to defend their countries and their independence. So if we are prepared to oppose to the aggressive policy presented by Kremlin or some other countries like Iran, uh, we may succeed and we may live in a peaceful and good world. Well, it's interesting you say that because, you know, I, I agree. I mean, you know, me, I'm, I, you know, foreign policy is my thing, is, which is why we do this show, one of the primary reasons we do this show. And many people would argue, you know, you know what, is, what is America's role in the world? What is the West's role in the world? You know, you know should America and the UK and, excuse me, others be the policemen of the world? Um, you know, the reality is, is that many people would argue that uh, the West has abandoned their, their, their role in the global uh, global community, uh, but but let me ask you this: If if America, regardless of the leaders, um, will people in the Balkans actually listen? I mean, are they more open to listening to what the West has to to propose, or are they more likely to listen to people more of the cultural background, like you know, from the Slavic nations like Russia uh, and the regions like that? Um, you mentioned that. Uh, uh, I prefer to think about the US and European countries, UK, as a leaders, not as a policeman. Okay. Uh, so if if there are leaders presenting what they can provide to the people as a good things, as a prosperity, the people will, will listen to them because we suffer and of this lack of the good news you said in the beginning of our talks. All the negative things are coming out from the screens, from the radio, from the social media. And I hope that people are wise enough to look at themselves as a somebody who wants to prosper and to have a peace. So, if we use this kind of messages coming from the Europe, from uh, all our allies and partners, I think that uh, the public will not listen all the negative things, all the threat that comes from Kremlin. Well, let's go back. Let's historically, uh, you know, in the region, in the Balkans, you know, we had the um, uh, 
years and years ago. You know, we had the whole uh, war with Kosovo, Serbia, and what's going on. You know, the bombings from the United States. Just out of curiosity, do do many? You know, what I'm finding around the world is you and I are getting up there in age, and so we remember these conflicts, but and the importance of these uh, and why they were important. But do you see that people in the Balkans remember the conflict that took place uh, between Kosovo and Serbia and the region? And the the influence of the Americans, and is that is that of, of importance to them to remember that? Mm, they remember, they remember, of course, and uh, uh, the people remember a lot of conflicts, by the way, uh, not only this one because we are rich of the conflicts in this region. Yeah. Uh, so some political parties, some political groups are using these good memories to send their messages and to stay in power because speaking a little bit nationalistic, uh, speaking uh, about the great Serbia, great Bulgaria, uh, influence some groups of people. So yes, people, they remember, uh, but uh, they remember this one because they cannot that there nobody take uh, their attention. They nobody speaks about the future. Uh, so if you don't see your future, of course you go back to see the history and to try to repeat the history. Exactly. Well, okay. Let's talk about let's talk about winning and losing. You know. So uh, what do you think? I mean, we we look at the Russian Ukraine war. If if. If Zelensky, if President Zelensky of Ukraine has to give up land as part of a peace deal, if he has to, I'm not saying he has to, but do you do you consider that victory, or do you consider, you know, I mean, what in your mind as a military uh, military professional is is would would constitute victory for the Ukrainians? I don't I don't know. Uh, the the victory should for Ukraine should be described by the Ukrainians. I cannot say which plan is the victorious plan, which end states will be um, the victory for, for this nation. Uh, but definitely, definitely, Russian policy, Kremlin aggressive policy should be stopped. Uh, for the Ukrainians, I, I, I understand that a little bit tired. The people lose a lot and they haven't yet enough support from Europe and from the United States to defend themselves. And we should be absolutely frank to say this one. And they are asking to get uh, uh, some military capabilities, but they do not receive them. Uh, so this may affect their decision, what they want to achieve uh, as an end state uh, and uh, to stop the war. I mean, that's, that's the issue. I mean, you know, we talk a lot about, um, you know, winning and losing and then, you know, winning and losing and victory is all, you know, what is the definition of victory? You know, if, if Russia takes some land and is given some land in, in Ukraine, whether it's Crimea, whether it's the Donbass, I mean, does that embolden Putin to continue to go into Moldova and then to complete this line that you talk about between Russia, Ukraine, and the Middle East? Who knows? But listen, we have two minutes left here. So let me ask you this question. If you, this audience, it's a global audience, uh, primarily a lot in Africa, but also around the world. If you had to, if you had to get across one message, one message to everyone listening to you, what would that message be? Oh, oh. yeah, I, I really appreciate such, such a question. <laughs> uh, my message, stay optimistic, be ready, fight for the democracy, be yourself and you're going to succeed. Well, that's very motivational. It really is. Um, no, I, and I agree because I think that, you know, I tell you what, what really is and what we do have to do is that we have as a world, 
um, and also on news programs is to talk more about the positives because you know if we keep focusing on the negatives and the negatives and the negatives it's by human nature it's going to drag people down and if you keep talking about the negatives people want you know a resolution to it and so they're willing to compromise and do anything to end the war uh, and this is where we have to change it we have to in my opinion and tell me what you think about this we must do we collectively not just americans or brits or bulgarians but we collectively must help people understand why you know what are the benefits to victory you know what you know why should we fight this war in america as you know it's a big issue where people say we shouldn't be part of it but do you see i mean if you had to say um how, on the scale i'm going to put it this way on the scale of one to a hundred victory in ukraine victory being basically defeating the kremlin how important in our lifetime is defeating uh, the Kremlin in Ukraine. You're not an easy guy. I, 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 I can't to make it totally this. easy for you. <laughs> uh, I will take the risk to say like 80, 90 percent, 80, 90 percent. It's crucially important uh, uh, to prepare our world and to live in a world where the conflicts are about ideas not about using the weapons killing the people oh i, I agree i agree i mean you know and then we have putin as i would argue a lot of it has to do with his ego and his legacy that he wants to do more to just restore the previous you know the soviet union and i mean that's what's happening we've seen most of the authoritarians around the world whether it's North Korea, whether it's Putin, um, you know, whether it's China, they're acting out of ego. And human nature is human nature. It's hard to, you know, if people have their mind set up to do something, they're gonna do it. Well, listen, it's been a pleasure. Uh, as always, it's great seeing you and talking to you. Uh, we don't see each other enough, so that's why I have to plan my trip to Bulgaria to see you. So, but um, anyway, thanks again. And thanks again for being here around the world with Dane Waters. Uh, next week, actually, I will be uh, in uh, Ukraine. We'll be broadcasting from there. But thank you very much for the, uh, being and watching today, and we'll talk to you soon. All the best.